All right, people, why don't we get started now? Welcome. Welcome back. Good to see you. I'm a little confused. I thought I made it abundantly clear on Monday that y'all should get the hell out of here while you still can. <laughs> and there's no good reason to, for any sane person to stay in this class. But I'm happy to have all of you insane persons here with me today. Um, Quick announcement. I, one thing I didn't make very clear on Monday is, uh, you know, we, we have these discussion sections once a week that you're going to go to starting <laughs> next week. And I didn't really talk about how you get into those, how you sign up for those. Uh, you're not going to do that through the normal online system like Access or, or the Simple Enroll. Um, we have our own form for the, this class that's going to go up on our website starting tomorrow, Thursday. I will email all of you when it goes up. I will post an announcement on our class webpage. So between Thursday and next Monday, you need to go into that form and you need to tell us what times you can go to section and we will assign you to a section. So that's how that's going to go. It'll go up tomorrow. I'll send you an email about it. Uh, for now, you don't need to do anything. Um, if you have somebody that you might want to work with as a partner on pair assignments in this class, you should try to get into the same section as them because partners have to be in the same section. So our form will ask you if you have a buddy and we'll try to put you in the same section with your buddy. Okay? Uh, yeah, so I want to pick up where I left off last time. Uh, we were talking about C++. I didn't get very far. I'm going to try to make up for that today. So C++, a lot of the syntax is not that different from Java. I know that not everybody here knows Java, but if you do, a lot of this is going to look like Java to you, I would say. Um, if you're looking carefully for differences, I guess what you might notice is that there's this thing here that says bool. What's that called in Java? Do you know? We mean, it's exactly the same thing as a logical data type, true or false. You can use it for if statements or while loops or this kind of stuff. They call it bool in C++. Uh, C++ often has shorter names. Java has nice long names. C++ has shorter names. For loops, if statements, a lot of that has exactly the same syntax. I mean, it's not a coincidence. Java mostly ripped off C++. <laughs> they base the language heavily on C++. That's why they're so similar. Loops, if statements, ands and ors, equals, non equals, divided by, return, parameters, functions. A lot of the syntax should generally look familiar to you. Okay? So we started writing simple programs. Now the programs that we started with, let me, let me go to um, Qt Creator for a second. So this was kind of a canonical program where you would say like C out, hello, uh, CS106X, and then you would say endl. Endl is the end of the line. So that's kind of a typical minimal C++ program. And we talked about most of the pieces. This is your main function. This is a statement to send output to the console. Fine. Uh, these statements I talked about a little bit. I wanted to talk about just slightly more. So the include statement is a lot like what's called an import statement in Java or Python or a lot of these other languages. This is when you want to connect a library to your program. Um, there's two kinds of libraries. There's language libraries and there's project libraries. Language libraries are like part of C++ language. If you install a C++ compiler, you get these libraries. Uh, project libraries are ones that I give you from Stanford. And so we have a slightly different syntax which tells the compiler where to look for them. Should it look in your project folder or should it look in the C++ compiler installation folder? Um, I'll try to make it really clear when I show you some syntax or some library features or whatever, I'll try to show you exactly what library you have to include in order to get those features. So um, there's two syntaxes. It's a little weird, but that's how it works. Um, so like, for example, there's a built-in library in the language called IOStream that has that C out functionality. You have to include that to print to the console. There's also a library that comes from Stanford called GWindow, and you have to put that one in quotes if you want to pop up a graphical window. Okay, so that's including a library. There was another statement at the top of the program that said using namespace STD. And um, that namespaces are scopes for variables. Oh yeah, question, go ahead. Sir, for your local, um, local library, you have to point to the directory first to tell uh, question is, um, if it's a local library, do I have to write the directory like slash whatever or slash? Um, generally, no. It will look in the directory of your files. And if it's not in that same directory, you can specify other paths for it to look at. And we set up our projects to look in a certain hierarchy of folders. So that should all be set up for you when you download a, your project to, to work on. Um, but if you started from scratch, you might have to tell it where the directories were for the libraries. Yeah. Um, so. This namespace idea, a namespace is basically a separation of scope for names. Names of functions, names of variables, names of classes. Um, 
the reason that we have this concept in the C++ language is because you know C++ has a lot of short identifiers like C out. You know, if C out is what you use to print things, that now means that you can't name a variable C out because it would conflict. You'd have a conflicting use of the same name. And so C++ tries to solve this problem by having these different name spaces where you can, you can use the same name in two different name spaces and it'll be okay. You don't have to think about that very much in this class, but you can write a statement in your program called using namespace, which means that you want to take all of the names of things that are in that namespace and you want them to be reachable in your program. So for example, this identifier called um, C out is its full name is actually std colon colon c out. That's like the full name of that variable. It's a variable named c out located in the std namespace. But if we're gonna use this a lot, it's really a pain to have to write std c out, std c out. So um, <clears throat> if you say using namespace std, it's a little bit like an import in the sense that I don't have to write the name of that namespace in front of that anymore. So I think one thing that's confusing for students is like, well, why do I have to say both of these? It seems like you're talking about the same kind of thing. They both involve bringing something from the outside into my program. What I would say is this include makes it so that I can use c out at all. This using statement makes it so I can use it with a shorter name. I don't have to write as many characters. So we often will write both of these in our, in our uh, code. Yeah? Does that mean you can Yeah, could you use more than one namespace? I think you can use more than one. Um, the problem is, what if the both of them have the same variable in them? They can conflict, so that gets a little bit complicated. I don't want to go into all the details of it, but yeah, I mean, you can do that. In fact, I could write my own namespace in my code. You know, I could do something like, you know, namespace foo, and then I could say like int x, and then over here in main, I could say foo colon colon x, and now that's a x that only lives in foo, but if I only write x, it won't, conflict with that x. There could be two x's now. So, I mean, I don't want to go too far off the deep end with these namespaces, but this is like a mechanism that the language uses to allow reuse of names of functions and variables and things without them colliding with each other. Yeah? Does the using namespace statement apply to just the block scope or the global scope? Um, once you say this in your file, the rest of your um, file will now have access to that namespace. And because of the way the compilation works, sometimes that means other files can see the namespace too. <laughs> so there's a common bug that happens where you have two files. One of them says using namespace. The other one doesn't, but it implicitly wants to use the namespace. And because they're both in the same project, it works. But then if you pull the one file apart from the other one, suddenly the same program doesn't compile anymore. <laughs> so some of the rules are kind of weird. Um, and it could be, and in fact, there are C++ programmers who have a rule that they never write a using statement. They always write out the full names of everything. But uh, I just, I can't bring myself to do that. So I'm not, that's not how I roll. Um, but whatever. You know, if I took that using statement out and I compiled this again, it actually, I know you can't read this text, but it says C out is not declared in this scope. So uh, I could return this to working by saying std C out. Um, and then it works. Endel is also in std. So I could make those have full names. By contrast, if I took away the include, but I had the using statement, that doesn't work either because like now it doesn't even link me to the C out library at any, no matter what I call it, it's not there. So it's kind of like, anyway, these two things often go together. Um, okay, so those are uh, imports and using <laughs> namespaces, yeah. Wouldn't you have to use namespace only if there were two possible C outs and both were in different namespaces? Right, you don't have to write the std uh, prefix if you have written a using statement. But if you don't have a using statement, you must write it. Like if I delete line seven, I cannot refer to C out bare. It won't understand. Only by writing this does it allow me to refer to the members of std without the prefix. So anyway. Um, I'm gonna always use namespace std and I'm gonna include libraries. And so I'm, I'm not gonna use this like colon, colon syntax, really. But I'm just letting you know that it's, it's there. Um, OK. So we talked about C out, printing statements. I'm not going to stay on this slide because we already talked about this. Uh, so a quick example of like a little program you might want to write is you know ask the user for who scored how many points, and then print who won the football game or something like that, right? So this blue part would be like I'm prompting the user to type a value, like input from the console. So if you're taking a wild guess, if I use C out for output, what do you think I use for input? Yeah. <laughs> UX people are smart. Um, yeah, I mean, that's right. There is a C in, 
But I have bad news for you. C in sucks. Um, it's not that different than C out. I mean, look, this is how you do it. You say C out, and you say, please tell me whatever, your age. And then you say C in, and then you tell it what variable you want to store that in, and it'll read from the user and put it in that variable. Kind of a funny syntax. Um, a lot of students get mixed up on the syntax, but it's just like the arrows are like, you know, go into that variable. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I don't know what mnemonic device you want to use here, but. This works fine. You, prompt, you tell them to type an age, it waits for them to type an age, it stores it in that variable, and then it prints the value, and it prints what they typed. And so uh, it says discourage. I haven't explained why that's the case. But this, this works. This will totally work. Yes? Uh, can you reverse the order and the, the direction of the operator? So Reverse the order of what, exactly? Like, could you do age and then the, the uh, less than, less than? Oh, I see. So, like, maybe kind of turn these two lines into one, int age, arrow, c in, or something like that. No, I'm going to talk about this a little bit later in today's lecture. Um, you have to declare a variable, and then you have to write c in with an arrow toward that variable. You can't, like, declare this on the same, this variable on the same line that you're trying to store in it. It has something to do with what's called a reference variable. I'll show you that in a minute or two. But this is kind of the way you have to say it if you want to do this c in gizmo. Um, uh, yeah, in the back. Go ahead. How does c in What does it do if you type in the wrong kind of a value? Like you don't type your age, you type uh, Marty or something. It's not an int. What does it do? Yeah, that's kind of part of why uh, this is discouraged. So let me just uh, answer that by, by trying it, right? So we're supposed to say how many points they scored, right? So this isn't that hard. Uh, so something like, you know, um, C out um, Stanford points scored, question mark. And I won't put endl because I want the cursor on the same line with the, so I'll do like int Stanford comma cal and then c in Stanford, right? And then maybe I'll do cal uh, and then I'll do cal <laughs> and then whatever. I'll do like if Stanford greater than cal c out, yay. And uh, I don't need the else because we'll never reach that case. I don't think. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> we don't waste any time in 106x. We don't need to write that else. But like, so I run the program. Oh, sorry. Actually, I wanted to show you something. Uh, so if you've got sharp eyes, I ran the program. And then down here in this little box, it says Stanford points scored. Because like, this is the default like, console for C++. And that doesn't work very well, and it's not very flexible. So um, we actually have this library that we link to in all of our projects that you're going to want to use. We say include console.h. And this is a cool library. Just by including it, that's all you have to do. Now you run the same program, and the console pops up as its own window. That's a Stanford gizmo. That's why it has the quotation marks instead of the brackets on it. Um, so anyway, that's the Stanford thing, but we're going to use that. So it says Stanford points scored, so I type, you know, 15, and Cal points scored 7 or whatever. Yay, we won. So now let me answer his question about um, Stanford points scored. A lot of points. It seems to have accepted that. <laughs> Cal sucks points scored, I don't know, 10. No, it's it, it just take A as the first input and then it takes yeah, so actually, I tried to type, and it didn't even let me type the score for Cal, because behind the scenes, it read A as Stanford score and lot as Cal score. And what ints are those, you say? Well, let's find out. Let's find out. Uh, see out score is Stanford to <laughs> Cal. You know, I just, we're just echoing what they typed, right? That's a pretty simple thing. So let me type uh, a lot of points. Score is zero to 32, what? <laughs> I don't think so. Their running back isn't that good, come on. Uh, what do you mean? Hmm. So it's, it's, it's giving me these weird values. Basically, long story short, uh, if you put the wrong kind of value in, it fails to convert, and therefore it doesn't store any value into these variables. So these statements fail and don't assign anything. So then that raises the interesting question of, well, what value do these have if you don't give them any value? Um, let me show you this. What if I comment this out? So I just never read anything. So let's see what we get. Score is 0 to 1. Wait, what? <laughs> what? What? Uh, let's, let's try again. Well, score is 0 to 1. Um, basically, uh, if you don't initialize a variable in C++, 
it has a random garbage value. <laughs> um, and so we never stored anything and we just print and we get miscellaneous things appearing on the screen. So anyway, look, uh, this program is fine, but it doesn't handle very well this situation where the user types a bogus value, right? So let me show you something a little better. Um, oh, yeah, question, go ahead. Yeah, question is like in some languages or contexts, their variable will get like a default value like zero. Uh, in some languages like Java and others, that's true. And the reason that that's true is because it isn't true in C++ and that's so frustrating that when they made Java, they're like, ah, make all the variables zero, please. And so this language doesn't have that. You're exactly right that in Java, if you don't initialize things, they sometimes get default values, they get zeros or something or null or this kind of stuff. C++, when you make a variable, I think you guys probably remember, a variable is just like a little piece of memory somewhere. And the idea is like before your program came along, there was something else in that memory. So whatever was there, we just treat that as an int and there's your int, that's your value. If you don't give it a value, it just uses that as the value. So I mean, anyway, C++ does not initialize things for you, therefore they contain random garbage. Sometimes if you rerun the same program, you get the same random garbage because your program happens to load into the same memory address as before. But yeah, uninitialized variables are bad. Um, anyway, there's a lot of problems with C in. Oh, oh yeah, question, go ahead. Uh, I thought that if you write a uh, string for an integer, then it just takes the first character and uses ASCII value. Oh, using ASCII values. Um, well, you might be thinking of C language. In C language, there are some character to integer conversions like that. I'm gonna talk about strings later today. I might be able to address that. Um, I mean, long story short, if you do this and they don't type an int, it just aborts and doesn't assign any value into the int. That's how this behaves. There are some contexts where there are some strange other things that happen, like you're asking about, and we will probably talk about that a little bit. But I would just say the summary is, I don't think you should use C in directly in this way. And what I do think you should do instead is that we have a library that we wrote here at Stanford called Simple IO that has these functions you can call, like get integer, get real number, or like a double, get a line, like as a string, different thing, get a Boolean as a yes or no question. And it will keep reprompting until it gets a value that's of the right type, and then it will return that to you. So um, if you want this to always get a valid score, instead of saying this, you, you actually replace both of these lines. The printing of the prompt message and the reading of the answer is you say um, Stanford equals get integer Stanford point score. I'll actually say int Stanford, and then I'll say int cal equals get integer cal sucks point scored. And then, yeah, so actually to do that, I have to include this simpio.h. So now I compile, I run, how many points did I score? A lot, that's an illegal integer. Okay, how about 87, cal sucks, you know, two, they got a safety or something. Okay, so then it, it keeps reprompting if it needs to. Okay, so that's my recommendation. Now, I will say, some students don't like using stuff that's not part of the language. This is a Stanford thing. If you go just out in the real world and use C++, you don't have this function. So if some people say, I don't want to do that, I want to do the real stuff. That's great, but I mean, if you want to read an integer and reprompt, you basically write the exact code that we wrote for this. It isn't very interesting code. So if you want to look at how this thing works, go ahead, it's not that interesting. I don't think this is what I want to focus on in this class. I just want to move on to more interesting problems. So, uh, yeah, question. Is there a list of these Stanford local directories that we can access online? Yeah, so uh, I have a slide. Let me see if that's, is that the next slide here? So on the class web page in the top link bar, there's a link that says Stanford library. I can't load the web, somehow my internet's not working today. So you have to just, I'm gonna do the interpretive dance of what the internet looks like here. <laughs> so. Um, Go to the class website, there's a link at the top that says Stanford Library, and it has a list of all of our different functions and all of our different libraries if you want to look at it. Um, and that's a direct link to that same documentation. So it's all there if you want to look through it. Okay. Um, yeah, so I want to move on. That was, that was actually the end of last lecture's uh, slide deck. See how far behind I'm getting, but um, oh well. So I want to talk about a couple of new topics. I want to talk about functions and strings today. And you know, I think that you all probably already know about functions and strings in your own favorite language, so I'm gonna try to focus on what's different about those things in C++. If you don't know what functions or methods are, or what strings are, then those are topics I'm expecting as prerequisite knowledge from you, so you need to go review that. Um, if you wanna read, it's chapters two and three of the, of the textbook, okay? 
So functions. You guys know functions and methods are very useful, right? I mean, you can take a group of statements and put them into a function, and then you call the function and it runs the statements. That's great. You can take parameters. You can return stuff. Um, the syntax for a function in C++ is pretty similar to the syntax in another language like Java. Um, in Java, there would probably be some other stuff over on the left here, right? Like what might be there in Java? Public, private, static, like modifier words like that. If it were Python or some other language, you might say like def or function here or something like that. But yeah, in, in Java, you have more like modifiers that you put here. But you know, if you just strip those away, the syntax looks pretty similar after that. Um, C++ in this context doesn't have some of those concepts of public and private quite the same way. So you can write a function, and then your main can call the function. So that's pretty simple. You guys know how calling functions work. The, the 1.0 goes up and becomes R. It does the calculation. It returns that back. It stores the result here. So parameters in return behave the way that you would expect from uh, Java for the time being. Yeah? Um, are, in C++, are you allowed to define functions after you call them in your program? Yeah, I'll show you that. You're asking about the order of defining the functions. Uh, the order matters more in C++ than Java. So I'll have to show you. My next slide, I think, will we'll address that. Let me let me have a second. I'll show you. Yeah. Can we not square numbers? Can you square a number? Oh, there is a squared function. There's a there's an exponentiation uh, command. I just haven't shown you, so I didn't want to like surprise with the, the function I never mentioned yet. But for sure, like if you want to do r times r, r to a power, there's a pow function for, for that. Yeah. Yes? Are you allowed to? Can you pass a function as a parameter? Yeah, this is something cool that Java doesn't have that C++ does have. There are function pointers. Um, I will talk about them. I'm not going to talk about them today, though, because that's a little further in. But yeah, that's a powerful thing where you say, here's a function. I want you to call this function for me later. Yeah, call back is kind of the, the term. Yeah. Um, will you have to find a class or struct in C++? Can we have like, private or public things? Yeah, I'm going to, and I think we, Three or four, I'm going to talk to you about classes and objects a little bit. When you make a class, you can make classes in C++. And when you make them, you can make things public and you can make things private. But in sort of this, what we call a free-floating function context like this, we don't really have that concept of private or public. They're just all functions. So we don't use those words here, but we will use those words other times. Yeah? Um, so I was wondering if you set uh, a 1, because if you pass the value of a 1 instead of 1.0, would it still treat us yeah, I think a lot of languages have pretty similar type conversion rules here. Like if you just say one, that's an int, but it knows how to auto-convert that to a double of 1.0. So some languages are super picky and they would give you an error. This behaves more like Java or Python where it'll convert it for you to a double. So it'll be okay. So that's a function. This is this should be pretty pretty chill, pretty, pretty okay. Like this doesn't surprise you, I don't think, too much. Um, let's get into the different stuff. So C++ allows you to do what's called a default value for a parameter. When you declare the function, you can put a value after an equal sign. And what that'll mean is when they call a function, down here these are calls to the function, if they don't supply a value, it will use your default value. It's kind of cool. So like, uh, this is a dumb example, but it's just like print a line. How many copies and what character? Well, however many copies you tell me, I'll print that character. So if you say print line seven question marks, it'll print this. If you say print line five, but you don't say what character, it'll print stars. And if you don't say anything, it'll print 10 stars. Um, there's a little bit of subtlety to this syntax. Like, you're not allowed to have some parameters with defaults, and then some with not defaults, and then some with defaults. Like, you can't do that because it has trouble figuring out which value maps to which parameter. Like, all the defaulty ones with these equalses have to be at the end of the list of parameters for the function. But um, that's a cute little, little feature of C++. Java doesn't have that. Yeah, in the blue shirt. Yeah. Um, oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, unfortunately, no. If, if these are both defaulted, there's no way to pass this without passing that. You just have to write a 10, basically. So, I mean, it is one of those things, like some languages have a way of doing that, but C++ doesn't have it because the parameter values are indicated only by their order, and so it's unable to disambiguate those. So, uh, was there another question, or maybe it was the same, same question? Okay. Yeah, like if you had eight parameters and you wanted two or three of them to be default D, you'd put those two or three as the last two or three. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's kind of cool. Um, now, you had a question a few minutes ago about the order that you declare functions, and so yes, this is a problem. This is my first, exhibit A, 
in the prosecution's case that C++ fucking sucks. <laughs> and you know that I almost never swear, so I wouldn't say that. <laughs> if you put the function after main, the stupid ass compiler can't find the function. And it actually won't compile. It'll say there's no function named circle area. It's right there. But it can't find it. So um, this is really bad. I just can't believe they screwed this up. This is so dumb. But everything has to be declared or defined before it is used in terms of like vertically walking through the code. So you, if you did Java or Python or something, this was not the case. It is the case in C++. So like for example, um, over here, like I, I'm just gonna dump all my examples into the same file here basically. But you know, if I have some kind of function called like, um, you know, uh, void song and it just prints lyrics of a song, you know, uh, uh, whatever, my life. upside down. What, I'm not going to type the whole song, I promise. So whatever, I, I, I print some song lyrics. If I come up here and I say song, that looks totally fine, but I compile it and it says, you can't read it, but it says song is not declared in this scope. Oh geez. So one thing you can do is you can cut this and paste it up above main so that this function is first. But um, I don't like that because I like to have main first. I like to pick my own order to declare things. I really like to just open the file and see the main. So that's okay, you can do that, but you just have to make one small change, which is that you have to put something called a function prototype up above in your file. A prototype is the heading of a function where you write out the name and the parameters and the return type, but then you don't put the curly braces or the body, you just put a semicolon. And this is like a IOU to the compiler. <laughs> I promise that later I'm gonna write this function. <laughs> and that allows the compiler to move forward and if I see that you have a circle area promise here, then if you call circle area, I will trust you. And then eventually, oh, there's circle area, okay, cool. And then the code is okay. I can't believe you have to fucking do this. This is so dumb, but it's just how it goes. So, so like here, if I wanna call this song function, I can just come up here. I mean, what I always do is I just grab this part before the curly, and then I just say semicolon. And now the thing compiles, and now it runs, and it prints the, the, the song at the start of uh, main. Yeah, question? I have a whole bunch of function prototypes. Right, so like what some people do is if they have like a whole bunch of functions, then what happens is your top of your file ends up with like a whole bunch of these prototypes, which looks kind of ugly, you know, not the same one, but many different ones. That starts to get ugly. So sometimes then you start splitting things into multiple files. You put all your prototypes in one file. That file often ends with a .h extension. These are headings of functions. That's kind of where that comes from. I'm not gonna do that today, but that's, you, you definitely would do that if you wrote a bigger program, split it up. Yeah. So uh, when you're splitting up the different files, then what's the point of, of, of even uh, uh, having the prototypes? Like, why not just like import the functions and sell them at the beginning? Oh, what's the point of the prototypes? Like, if you have two files and you yeah. import the other file, um, I I kind of want to give you the hand waving explanation. Like, basically, what happens is if like this file imports that file, then it actually makes a second copy of all the functions. Like, in, including is literally a copy paste. It literally goes to this file copies all of the lines and pastes them right there. And so what ends up happening is if you have two files and the first one includes the second one, then you bind them into an executable, you actually have two copies of the second file and it doesn't work because they conflict with each other. It's just, it's weird. Like it's this dumb stuff about how C++ does compiling and linking of, of binary data. And like I just, I hate getting into the weeds on that. It's, that's the kind of stuff you do more in 107. Um, it's sort of interesting, but it's mostly just a pain because your program isn't building properly or whatever. So what we end up doing is we use these prototypes so that everybody's allowed to call the functions and then one of the files writes the definition of the function and then everything works out when the compiler links all of that together. So, uh, yeah, question. How do you have optional parameters inside of the function prototype? Oh, optional. If you have optional parameters like, uh, you know, like maybe you say like uh, int times, like how many times do you want to print this for <laughs> int? i equals zero, i is less than times, i plus plus. And so I'll print the song however many times you say. So then, um, you know, you can say I want the song to appear 10 times, right? Um, so then up here you would say int times, so they would match each other. But how do you do the default parameters? If you have this split between a prototype and a body, you put the, the default up in the, the prototype only. Um, that's just what you do. And then, so here if I say, song with no parameter, it will print five copies of the song. So, okay, yeah. Uh, 
Um, if can we, uh, if we have a prototype and you know the normal function, can we define the default in both places? If you have a prototype and a body, can I put the equals five here? I believe it has an error if you restate the. You would think you could just say equals five here too, but I think it gets mad. Yeah, it says a default parameter is already given or something. I, yeah, it, it, it doesn't like that. So I don't know. I mean, look, it's a stupid language. I mean, I'm sorry. <laughs> I hate C++. We're going to survive. We're going to use it. It wouldn't be my first choice to teach this class in, but nobody asked me. So um, <laughs> apparently I have to teach you about pointers and stuff. So I have to teach you C++. But uh, I don't like C++. I don't use C++. People making lots of money don't need to know C++, but it's a vehicle. We're going to learn a bunch of cool stuff that happens to be in C++. Um, OK, so that's a prototype. Here's just, this is kind of just a random slide. Like There's a math library with a bunch of useful mathematical functions. You asked me about squaring a number. And yeah, you can, if you include C math, you can uh, do pow of whatever to the, this exponent. And so all these functions take these parameters and they return results out. You know, they, most of them take doubles as their parameters, but you can pass ints and it'll convert. And so I'm not going to really spend any time on this because whatever language you learned, you probably did something like this already. In Java, I think you say math.pow, math.abs. So like, it's basically the same idea. You just don't say math. Dot, you just say abs. Yeah. What's the namespace for SDI? Yeah, good question. He asked about namespaces. Actually, uh, that's one place where my slides are not always very uh, clear. All of these functions are in that std namespace, just like C out is. So actually, if I didn't say using, I would have to say std colon abs, std colon pow. Uh, so actually, I get so used to using that std namespace because so many things are in there from the standard libraries. Like basically, all their stuff is in there. So like I, you know, all this stuff starts to give you errors if you take away that using statement. Yeah. So okay. Oh yeah. Question. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, so does that mean that if you have Uh, I'm not sure if I totally understand your question. I mean, using a namespace isn't like a copy-paste in the same way that an include is a copy-paste. Mm -hmm. Using namespace is more like a set of shortcuts that it understands or doesn't understand. So if one of your files says that it's using std namespace and the other one does, those don't duplicate and, and collide with each other in a bad way. It just means that both of those files are allowed to use those shorter names to refer to those variables and functions. And if one file does use std and the other one doesn't, the other one might not be able to use those short names. Uh, so I don't, I don't know if I really answered your question correctly. Did I miss your point? Uh, a little bit. Okay. <laughs> Listen, you should just kiss up a little more and be like, your brilliant answer wasn't the answer to my question. No, no, so, no, help me out. What? So tell me again. So you were saying that uh, when you include CMAP, those are all still in the STD namespace. So does that mean like, and, and also like in IO stream, those are also in the STD namespace. So does that end? If these are defined in different files, does that mean that they're both they both have namespace std with all these defaults? Oh right, right. And it, if you were to open the source code of these, they start with a line that says namespace std curly brace, and then all of the implementations of these functions, and then a closing curly brace. Both of those files have that. It, and uh, now I think I know what you're saying. It is possible for two different files to both have namespace blocks with the same names, and it will sort of union them together. Okay. It's not like one of them is the namespace and the other one isn't, or they collide. Like you, they sort of all become part of that yeah, namespace. That that Yay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Question answer. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for your compliment. I never back away from the puns. Yes. So in that case, you just explained where you have two separate libraries, um, declaring that they're both going to go into the same namespace. How does C++ resolve namespace collision? Um, how does C++ resolve collisions between namespaces? Uh, I mean, I'll tell you this. I don't honestly remember all the rules, um, but that should comfort you as well. <laughs> Not, it shouldn't comfort you that I'm incompetent, but what <laughs> I've never had to care is the point. And you probably don't have to care either. It's rare for things to collide because like people who collide with STD names, they're like, oh gosh, everybody uses namespace STD, so I don't want to collide with that, so they pick a different name. So. What does it actually do? I forget. I think if it's ambiguous, it's an error. But there are some cases where one of them wins, and so it uses that one. And frankly, the rules are kind of crazy. And so like, I learned it once, and I was like, ah, screw this. I don't know. Sometimes it depends what order you say that you're using them. Sometimes it depends what files link to what other files. Depends what the symbol is. It depends if it can disambiguate between them. It's kind of a big mess. 
So um, some people really, you know, get into the weeds on all that, and I, I don't find that super interesting in terms of memorizing all of it. So if I have a problem, I just kind of look it up, honestly. So I don't, I don't actually know. Yeah. Um, so if all of these functions If you say using namespace, that doesn't mean I want to bring in all of the contents of that namespace into my program. It means that if I happen to refer to a name and the compiler isn't able to find that name in my file, it should also check in the STD namespace to see if that thing is there. But if I didn't include the CMath, those functions are not attached to my code, so it won't find them there. So I, it's kind of kind of subtle, but that's sort of how it works. Yeah. Did you say earlier that you <laughs> You guys love namespaces. Do you know that? <laughs> I've never Not met them. Not all of us. Yeah, that guy's sick of it. Um, I've never met such a pro namespace crowd. I love it. <laughs> you guys like to keep everything separate. I bet you all have individual refrigerators in your dorm. It's my namespace. Stop touching my stuff. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so. I think you're asking, like, can you have more than one namespace, or does it all go in one global namespace? Yeah. I mean, if you don't declare one, you're part of a global namespace. And that's all the programs we have been writing are global. And if you do have a namespace block with curlies, then that code will be in that namespace. Within a single file, you could have one part that's in this namespace, and one part that's in that namespace, and one part that's global, and you can mix and match all of these things. I think in general, I'm not going to ask you guys to write a lot of namespacey stuff in this course. You have to be a little bit fluent of namespaces to include things from other places that you're going to use. But um, writing your own namespace would be more something you would do if you worked on a larger project and you had lots of files, lots of people, you would want to split things up. So anyway, um, I want to talk about value and reference semantics. You guys know this, but you might not know this name for it. Value semantics means when you pass a parameter, it copies the value. So like if I have a swap function, you pass me A and B, and I switch their values. I move A to a temp. I set A's value to be B's value, and then I put the temp back into B. So I, I swap the two values, right? So then down here in main, I have two ints, and I call swap on them, and then afterward I print them, and it didn't swap them. Do you see it still has the same, I know you can't see it in the bottom of the slide always, but basically it didn't, it didn't do it. The swap doesn't do it in main. And the reason for that, I think you guys should know this, is that when I pass x and y as parameters, it doesn't like link this function to my variables x and y, it just grabs the values of those variables and it puts those values into these and then it runs the function using those values. Right? That's what value semantics means. You've done that a thousand times, you take it for granted. And uh, is this always how it works when you pass parameters like this? Like, when is it not like this? Yeah? Projects. In, in many languages, <laughs> objects have a different behavior. If you pass an object as a parameter, like an array list or something, it will, if you modify the list in the function, you will see the change back in main, right? So that's interesting. That's a different kind of thing called reference semantics. So a lot of languages, when it comes to like what kind of a variable or what kind of a parameter will use what kind of semantics, this is implicitly dictated by what data type you're using. If you're using a primitive value like an int, you'll use this value copying semantic. If you're using a complicated object or an array, it will use this referential semantics instead. So it's decided for you by the language and the type system. C++, <laughs> you can decide whatever you want. So if you want to pass an int using these sort of object style reference semantics, you can. And the way to do so is you put an ampersand after it. And this means I want a reference to an int. It's a, if you've done C, this is a little bit like a pointer, but not quite. Um, and so this small change will make it so that if you, if you pass x and y here to this function, it will literally link this variable a to this variable x. They will be aliases of each other. If you change one, it will change the other. And the same thing for y becomes b. So if in here, if I swap these, down here in main, it really will swap them, and I will see the difference. That's kind of cool. You can't do that in Java. One must wonder, if Java came out after C++, surely the designers of Java knew about this beautiful feature, but they chose not to include it. <laughs> hmm. I wonder what that might mean. I don't know. Um, <laughs> well, I'll tell you. I'll answer my silly question. This is great, this is a cool thing, it's a powerful thing, but it can be abused. And I'll tell you this, 
if you look at a blob of C++ code, like imagine you only have main and this thing is in some other file, so it's not on your screen. You only have main. And you see this called x comma y swap. I mean, maybe you can infer stuff because it's called swap or whatever, but like you don't know whether it's a reference or a value that you're passing. And so now you're not sure if that function could mess with the value of your variable or not. And so it's harder to reason about C++ code and what it can do, what it can't do. When you're debugging, a crucial thing you need to do is to limit the surface of, 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 of the part of the program that could be causing the bug. You know, I know this isn't the problem. I know that isn't the problem. It's probably here somewhere. It's harder to speak like that about C++ code because you have all these like referency things floating around that could be changing. And it's harder. Uh, yeah, question. Yeah, that's a good question. Like you, you said in Ruby, you have exclamation marks for mutation, for modifications. It helps you visually see if you could change something. Yeah, um, C++ doesn't really have that. Uh, I mean, this is an old language, and when they made it, they didn't think about it, basically. And so if you want to indicate that, that's kind of on you. Like, you could sometimes put a little comment here that says mutate or reference, or here you can put comments and stuff. And, but yeah, it's kind of up to the developer to optionally indicate things like that. Um, so, I mean, unfortunately, no, the language doesn't have those sorts of things. And frankly, languages like Ruby that do those things that you're describing, they do it because they learn from this, basically, that not to match this, basically. Uh, yeah? What's the difference between a reference magic and a pointer? What's the difference between a reference and a pointer? Um, so, I mean, I'm not assuming that anyone here knows what a pointer is, but for a few of you who do, uh, a pointer is basically the same idea as this, except pointers require more changes to the syntax. This is a very minimal change to the program, and then it does what I want. A pointer, I have to use these asterisks, and I have to use ampersands and asterisks in more places to get the right behavior. Pointers also have fewer safeguards, and it's more likely to cause crashes, and references are fairly simple and bounded and easier to get right. And so this is an evolution of the idea of a pointer. It's meant to replace many of the uses that old C programs used with these pointer features. I, I will talk to you about pointers in this course, but it's out of scope for, for today. <laughs> Um, okay, so these are reference semantics. I wanted to mention that any type of data can be passed in this way, an int, a double, a string, anything. So it's kind of up to the programmer whether a value is passed as a copy or whether it's passed as a reference. Kind of cool. Um, so here's an example. A lot of times reference parameters are used for what we call output parameters. So I don't know if you've ever heard of this XKCD comic. There's a, there's a comic that talks about um, how, uh, what age range of people is it okay to date before it gets creepy because you're too different in, uh, in age. Um, don't worry, y'all are far outside of my range. We're cool. But um, <laughs> there's this formula here, like if they're half your age plus seven, it's okay. Or if they're old, you know, whatever, your age minus seven times two, it's okay. I mean, it's just a joke. But like, if you wanted to say, hey, I'm this old, what's the minimum and maximum age of people that I could go on a date with and it wouldn't be creepy? Well, that's like a function that I wanna, I wanna pass in the age and I wanna return these two things, right? C++ and Java and a lot of languages don't have a way to return two things. But what you can do is you can have two reference parameters that you store things in, and that provides two outputs. So this is sometimes called an output parameter, output reference parameter. So actually, if you look at the main, I declare young and old, and then I call age for 48, young, old. And actually, if you notice, I don't even give these any value. I don't even initialize them, because the value gets set up here when min refers to young, and when max refers to old, it sets their value. So I don't actually have to say equals zero or whatever. I just don't leave, I don't put any value there. So this is an example of sort of returning two things by using reference parameters. Yeah. So is, the, is this style convention to put the output parameters at the end of the function? Or end of the list? Oh yeah, is this a convention to um, put these at the end or whatever? Um, I don't know, loosely, I mean maybe, I, I would say there are so many different situations of functions and parameters and things that I, I wouldn't want to give you an overly strict rule about that. Um, what I will say though, is you don't want to make everything a reference. Like I could have made this in ampersand age, but there's no need for that because I'm not like, I don't want to modify the gauge back here. So if you don't need it to be a reference, you shouldn't make it a reference. You should use this sparingly when it's helpful and not just all over the place. Uh, yeah. uh, if, you, if you don't make it a reference, does it just like copy the object? Oh, 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 you're asking if I pass an object, but it's not a reference to an object. Yeah, I'm going to teach you about objects later, but there are some funny rules, like if you have an object, like a student or a bank account or an array or whatever, and you pass it as a parameter without an ampersand, it will make a full copy of the thing, which is very weird and not what Java would do. So um, I'm not, I'm not going to go into great detail about that right now, but yeah, I mean, that's, that's an issue that we want to 
we want to revisit soon. But go ahead, follow up. Yeah. So would it like, be more like memory efficient to pass a reference even if you weren't modified? Oh, you said the E word. You said efficiency. What's more efficient? Um, yeah, so uh, uh, I'm just kind of teasing you because a lot of X programmers care about efficiency. What uses more memory? What uses more runtime? I want a fast, lean, mean program, you know? Um, and I care about that too, but I care more about that on the large scale than on the small scale. So like some people go, well, why don't I pass this age as a reference? Because then I don't have to copy it, so I save like four bytes of memory. <laughs> <laughs> the kind of people who do that are the same idiots who pick pennies up off the ground. It doesn't, it's not going to matter, you know, you don't need this. It's such a small savings, right? Um, so I don't think it's worth passing int by reference for efficiency. Now you're talking about not that, you're talking about like a big object. If I pass that as a reference, I don't have to copy this big thing. That's more valid, especially if you're some giant array full of data. I don't want to copy the whole thing. We'll, we'll get to that. But yeah, uh, big things you want to pass by reference sometimes for efficiency's sake, but not little ints and stuff. Yeah? Uh, just a clarification. For like a non primitive data type, like an object that you just said, um, do you know if C++, when it does the copying, it makes it deeper? For a non-primitive type, like an object, like say an object that has references to other objects. In the yeah, yeah. I want to come back to it. I mean, I, I'm going to get there. I, th I think we're getting ahead a little bit. Like objects that refer to other objects. If you make copies, you can make deep copies or you can make shallow copies. I think by default things are shallowly copied. So if two things point somewhere, they point to the same thing or whatever. But it's possible to make deeper copies. I'll come to it. I, I don't want to go too far in that direction today. Um, anyway, okay. So uh, I, I'm kind of in summary here. Uh, about parameters, you can return more than one thing, you can avoid making bulky copies of objects, but it makes it harder to reason about this code. If I pass foo ABC, is it gonna change A, B, and C? Are they references, are they values? I don't know, I'd have to go look at the foo function to figure that out. Um, sometimes references can be slower, not uh, with ints, but in certain cases they can be slower because you have to set up these memory pointers and stuff. And you can't pass a literal value as a reference. You have to pass a reference to a variable. That's the whole point is you're referring to a memory location. You're referring to a variable. So if you're going to say 39 here, if that's a reference parameter, it won't, won't compile. So in your previous example, you put the age reference example. Right. So actually, if I change this to int reference age, I would not be able to pass 48. I'd have to make int my age equals 48 and then pass my age. Because you have to be referring to something that's an int variable, not just a literal value. Kind of a subtle distinction, but yeah. Okay, so I've got a few minutes left. I'm just going to use all the time that I have here. Um, one thing about functions, uh, you know, I haven't been writing any very big functions or very interesting functions in class with you live, but when you write a big program, you end up splitting it up, decomposing it into lots of functions. And I would say overall, you want main to kind of drive the program, and main calls most of the other functions to do the work. Now sometimes this function calls, it says method, but sometimes it calls another one. So I'm not saying main does all of the calling, but main's kind of the manager in charge of things. A common style I see students do that I think I want to discourage is where main calls the first function, and then the first function calls the second function, and then the third function calls the fourth function, and, and so on. And main sort of is like one line that like starts things off and then we never return ever again. Uh, <laughs> I call this chaining, I think it's bad style because it, it couples these all together. I can't isolate these and do them individually. I can't just call method two without getting method four along with it. So uh, it's better to have main kind of manage things. Um, I've got some examples later in the slides that I'm probably not gonna, not gonna reach, but um, okay. So wait, let's do, as a last thing, uh, since I'm running out of time, I'll cover strings on, on a Friday, but let's talk about this example. Imagine I want a quadratic equation solver. You know quadratic equation, uh, a squared, x plus, ax squared plus bx plus c equals zero. Um, you want to find the roots of it, you use this quadratic formula. There's two roots, one where you do plus here and one where you do minus here. You guys know this stuff. So um, I want to pass in what quadratic equation I'm, I'm solving and I want to get these, these roots back out. So if this was the equation, I'd want to get out these two roots. Now, not every quadratic equation has two real roots, but maybe for the minute, let's ignore it. Let's pretend we're dealing with ones that do. So I could write this code as C++, but I want to talk more about the design of the function. What should the heading of the function be? What should the parameters be, and what should the return value be? Any thoughts? Uh, maybe somebody I haven't called yet with the yellow shirt. Yeah, what do you say? Yeah, so it should accept the, the numbers A, B, and C. The coefficients, yeah, the a and the b and the c, okay. And then because we're returning two different values, we should probably do those as reference 
Okay, great. So these A, B, and C, should these be values or references? Oh, values. Those are value yeah. ints or doubles. We don't modify them, we just need their values of them. Right. And then these two roots are, what did you say again? Uh, output parameters for reference. Those are references to, to um, numbers that we will uh, store as returns, basically. Right, so then what should be the return type of the function? I guess void, we're not like returning, literally returning anything. We're sort of output parameter returning these two things. Right, uh, yeah, question. Um, would it not be clear to like return a list or an array as? Oh, sure, sure. So another design would be return a list, an array of the roots. It would have two elements or whatever. That's fine too. I just, I'm copying out here because I haven't taught you lists or arrays yet. But if I knew arrays, that would be another valid solution. I think what you said a minute ago is a great solution. Take A, B, and C as regular value parameters. Take these as reference parameters, fill these in. That's the sort of result that gets sent back to the person that, uh, that calls this thing. One last question, and then we'll head home. Yeah. So right now we're assuming that the quadratic equation has two distinct real groups, right? So in case we're considering a general quadratic equation, could we make the return type an int and return the number of real roots? Yeah, um, if you wanted to handle ones that don't have two real roots, I believe if you look at the is it discriminant here, determinant, whatever, this D, I think his sign, zero, negative, positive, will tell you how many roots and so I punted on that. Oh, no, a system problem. I punted on that for this example, but that would be the fix for that. Okay, I'm going to stop there, but if you're an eager beaver and you want to look ahead, I've posted an early link to part of our homework one if you want to look. Uh, but I officially will assign homework one on Friday. So I'll see you guys then. Thanks.